Welcome everyone back to the Coalition for Marriage YouTube channel, the UK's largest pro-marriage organisation representing tens of thousands of individuals from all faiths and none who support this issue of one man, one woman marriage. But of course the biggest uh, ecclesiastical organisation that seems to be having questions around these issues at the moment is the Church of England. Church of England have recently had another synod meeting, its governing body, uh, just this July. And again it's a real privilege to have uh, Reverend Dr Ian Paul back to tell us exactly what, if anything, happened at that synod. Ian, what a joy to talk to you again. Uh, for those of you who don't know you, you are an author, a blogger, a writer, a very popular commentator, member of the Church of England Synod and the Archbishop's Council. So hopefully you're an authority on these kind of things. And I just thought we'd take a minute to catch up on the recent synod which has taken place and the thing which, of course, is on everyone's lips, this idea about the blessing of same-sex unions. I wonder if you could just tell us quickly what's the update from the last synod on that issue? Nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> don't beat about the bush <laughs> is, is that is that the end of the end of the discussion no. <laughs> well, it was really great to talk to you <laughs> i know you've, you've written in other places that you know there are issues of trust and yeah. credibility yeah. and confidence because really these are doctrinal matters yeah. but they're being pushed through as if they're not doctrinal matters and in some kind of other way yeah. and just you know what's going on in the background well oh okay what's going on in the background there we go okay now maybe we're getting to the question um tony for those who've been following in february Every synod, we had a massively long eight-hour debate over a couple of days around the outcome of this extended process of living in love and faith, which had been going on since 2017. Um, in the end, the living and love, living and love and faith material didn't settle any questions at all. What they were designed to do was to offer resources to create space for discussion. That process came to an end with with some delay because of the pandemic uh, during 2022. Out of that, the House of Bishops and the College of Bishops, the House of Bishops means the diocesan bishops plus some um, elected suffragans as well. The College of Bishops means the entire 104, I think it is, bishops in the Church of England. Right. Um, and so those two groups have been meeting. So in other words, the College of Bishops then sometimes extended to the, to, sorry, the House of Bishops plus sometimes extended to the College of Bishops. Now, in, in theory, what they've been then doing is coming to some conclusions out of the end of the LLF process. The problem is that the LLF process has, has not resolved a thing. Mm. So it's meant that the, the bishops then have been discussing, well, what are we going to do about this? Uh, and, and what's come out of it, I think, is an awful lot of questions. The net result is that in principle, the bishops have been doing lots of work addressing those questions. But I think in the end, the truth has been that's emerged is that there's something of a, a deadlock. The House of Bishops themselves are divided on this question. And we might come back to what they're divided on. I think that's really important to explore. Uh, and what that meant then was that very, very hurriedly at the end of 2022 and um, beginning of 2023, the, the time was running out because the commitment had been made that the bishops would bring something to Synod in February 2023. The net result was because everything was pushed through, what was brought to Synod in February 23 was incoherent and incomplete. And it was really evident that, that ideas had been pushed through without proper consideration. As a result, at the end of the debate in, 20, in February 23, uh, we had a long motion saying that the, the Synod welcomes the direction and that the bishops have been working in and we hope for further work and further resolution. But the one amendment after lots of debate that was included was a simple restatement of the fact that the doctrine of the church on marriage has not changed. And that's been asked again and again. And the repeated answer is the doctrine of the church has not changed. The doctrine of the church is in canon law, which says that marriage is, quote, according to our Lord's teaching, a lifelong union or exclusive mm. union of one man and one woman. Mm. Then at February, we were promised, oh, well, all the work will be done and we'll bring something to, to July Synod. And then and they set up three working groups to look at three primary issues one is what prayers could we use to celebrate the lives and relationships of those who are in same-sex relationships without blessing those same-sex relationships because if we were blessing those same-sex relationships that would be indicative of a change in the doctrine of the church and we just said the doctrine of the church is not changing the second is the pastoral guidance for those who are in ministry uh who in, in an ordained ministry uh, and of course, those in ordained ministry promise to uphold the doctrine of the church, which has not changed in their ordination vows. So the question is, what leeway is there for any guidance on how they might live their lives? How is that going to change? And the logical answer is, well, we can't see any scope for change. And, and yet, apparently, we're waiting for some guidance on that. 
And then the third group was supposed to be looking at what provision should be made for those who are unhappy with the direction that the church was going in, even though actually the doctrine of the church hasn't changed. Three groups were set up and they met very hurriedly and they resolved absolutely nothing. Those groups were then disbanded, but nobody's been informed of that. And then we come to July Synod and nothing's been presented hmm. except a comment that progress is ongoing. And we had three hours of conversation in the uh, uh, Saturday afternoon and somehow or other we managed to spend three hours saying absolutely nothing so mm. so that, mm. that that's where that's formally where we're at formally speaking because mm. of course that there are i mean there are some logical inconsistencies if the church wants to bless relationships that it don't doesn't recognize as biblical marriages which presumably are sexual relationships well what about other people who are having sexual relationships outside of marriage heterosexually do they get blessings too um, you know, it, it doesn't. It really doesn't make any sense at all, does it? Well, I think the difficulty is it doesn't, and that, that's becoming clearer and clearer. But I mean, the one thing that is becoming, it is really clear, is that the church there's there's no desire on the part of the bishops for the doctrine of the church to change, and um, because we keep making this unfortunate phrase, because because many of us feel we're not getting straight answers in the in the sessions, then there is um, part of synod which is called questions where any member of synod can ask any questions of the mm. relevant parties to, to who are accountable to synod. So we can't ask sort of all sorts of questions of thought, but only we can ask directed questions and we, we have to ask questions of fact, we can't solicit opinions. So there's been a whole series of factual questions around this issue of doctrine. And again and again, the particularly um, Sarah Mullally, who's been the, the Bishop of London, who's been overseeing this work, has stood up and again and again said there is no plan there are no plans whatsoever to change the doctrine of marriage and that reinforces what was formerly resolved in synod and of course that's got a long history in, in, in the church in, in recent years as well so the one thing that's become clearer and clearer and clearer is that there is no appetite and no plan to change the doctrine of marriage so the question is how much wriggle room is there within that and as you say the logical answer is uh there is very little wriggle room there's there's, there's no there's no wriggle room so i think what it what what it feels as though is happening is that the sort of the the honest realization of that is being postponed and postponed and postponed and of course that's i think making everybody feel frustrated and in fact in that afternoon session where we had um time for mm. questions i uh did say rather pointedly when are we going to get honesty we, we keep talking about lack of trust here how are you going to restore yeah. trust you know you keep saying to us mm. things that are contrary and and, and there's a lack mm. of there's no transparency in the in the house of bishops meetings the house of bishops is a house of synod in principle mm. they are supposed to have public meetings with public minutes that anyone can attend because they're a house of synod we're a public body and yet they invoke a standing order which says we may suspect we may meet uh, uh we may call this a meeting which is not a session of the house of bishops therefore we don't have to publish our minutes well th that doesn't help to engender trust so i think that we, i think we could very interestingly um for the first time a group of 22 bishops said um there's been a proposal instead of actually proceeding with this through synod instead the archbishops will simply impose or authorize these prayers by fiat without any discussion and finally, for the first time, a group of bishops have stood up and said, 22 bishops have said, we don't agree with this. This is not the way to proceed. Controversial issues must be agreed through due process. And then some others have replied to that and said, we want some more honesty in the church and we, this needs to just all be resolved and all happen. And I think honesty is what we need. We need more honesty at every level about what has been going on and where we're at. Because mm. otherwise they're saying, well, we're not changing doctrine. We're just going to bless alternative doctrine. And it's, you think, well, is there really a difference? Well, this is this is again part of the frustration. And and you mm. know, for those who want to see change and who said we want an honest church, I think that's the one thing mm. I would absolutely agree with them and say we want honesty. Mm. So we've mm. been told that there's a distinction between holy matrimony, as the church understands it, and marriage as society understands it. But that's never been the way the church has understood it. So let's be honest and say, I'm sorry, that distinction does not hold up. We've been told that we can have prayers which bless people, but don't bless the relationships we're in. They're in. And I'm sorry, that's just not not honest. We, 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 were, we were told in the February Synod, we were told that the draft prayers of love and faith, which were sort of being just sort of floated and see what people's reaction were, had no relation to existing liturgy or anything related to marriage and yet we just suddenly discover that half of these prayers are actually borrowed from material specifically designed to be related to marriage so again let's have a bit of honesty about this let's have some honesty about where the bishops uh, are, are actually at
and and I, th- I suppose two two questions that I've had as well is that how can bishops say they want to see change in doctrine when they took public vows to uphold the doctrine of the church and to expound it again i would like some honesty about that honestly bishops if, if you're a bishop who says you don't believe in the doctrine of the church on marriage how does that square with the vow the public vows you took again let's have some honesty about this mm. so uh, what's the way forward i mean is it november that we look to next or is anything <laughs> going to be happening well, the, the, what's the way forward? Who knows? I, I don't know. I can't remember when it was with you uh, before or with somebody else, but I said, look, what, what it seems to me is that those who are wanting change are like people who are driving a juggernaut and they've just turned down a blind alley and they've still got their foot on the accelerator. And, you know, mm. how, how's that mm. going to end? And the answer is not happily for anybody. Do we end up with something like the, what was the, the, the Barman Declaration, you know, <laughs> where, where those people who say, actually, we are the real church, you know, we're going to come up with our own declaration of what the church is, and you cannot just adapt it based on society's changing values. You know, uh, um, you know, we're not going to put up with it anymore. I don't think we can. I don't think we need to. The reason is the content of our so-called Barman Declaration is already in canon law. I mean, I think the difficulty is for those of us who do believe the doctrine of the church and do believe that marriage is between a lifelong union between one man and one woman, uh, according to the teaching of our Lord, why why should we, why do we need to make any declaration? Why do we need to change? Is, is there not some kind of clause, some kind of, well, actually, bishops, you're, you're preaching against the canon of the scripture, you're, you're ultra vires, you know, there's something which kind of excludes you from doing what you're doing. Is, is there not some sort of law that says that in the church? Well, in a sense, yes, there are appropriate courses for, for, for process of discipline as the clergy discipline measure. Uh, ultimately, you can take people through the ecclesiastical courts, but these are these are I mean these are not these are not good ways of dealing with this. I suppose I'm, I'm simply wanting to sit down with my brothers and sisters in Christ and say how how does this make sense? How do you square these things together? And and I think the 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 other dynam- dynamic of this is that actually continuing to postpone. Um, honesty and honest resolution here and saying look actually there's very little room for maneuver if we're not changing doctrine the thing that i feel concerned about is that not only for those who do uphold the doctrine of the church is this frustrating to see this you know being played around with actually for those who want to see change it's also frustrating them it's not keeping anybody yeah. happy yeah 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 it's yeah. kind of like dangling hope before them and saying oh don't mm. worry don't worry just stick with us and eventually you'll see change coming well actually a number of them mm. are saying we don't believe we ever will see change and i i, yeah. I think they're right and i think it's unkind and unfair to them to, to to dangle the hope of change in front of them if it isn't coming if change is coming then at least say it honestly and we know we're exactly where we are at the moment we're just in this sort of bizarre no man's land where where uh n- neither side is happy everyone's frustrated there's a lack of honesty and transparency and we just need we just need a bit more straightforward so i was in, i was in a meeting the other day and i said i said some i said some um straightforward things about what i thought was going on and interestingly one of the people in the meeting then afterwards sent me a, a, an email saying thank you very much for for speaking in uncoded language i think the problem with the church of england we, we sort of end up speaking this sort of this coded language where we're, we're giving hints and suggestions rather than actually saying well this is how it is and i think we just need a bit more straightforward honesty well so i mean some things did happen so you've agreed to uh an experiment to take away fees for weddings is that a good thing i think it's a very good thing uh tom wolford who led the debate from i came from um i came from a deanery motion and then went became a diocesan motion blackburn and then came to synod and i think that was very good um and the, re- the reason is that it you know as tom said we think that marriage is a gift of god in creation he said how can we think it's a gift and a good thing for people uh, if we charge them for it and 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 charge them amount, an amount which does genuinely put off some people particularly it puts off poorer people and the statistics on marriage are really shocking well you know you'll yep. know this very 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 well that, yep. that marriage yep. is a preserve of effectively the wealthy elite because yep. something like 80 percent of the wealthiest in in life get married in, in, in the in the culture get married and yep. like only 20 percent of those who are not uh, yep. wealthy get married and we know that um marriage is a key indicator in terms of stability in terms of yep. welfare for couples yep. in terms of welfare and attainment for children so at last you know here we are something in the church of england saying something positive about marriage so i think that's really good and we had some other really important debates as well and we had a debate about um uh revitalizing the parish for mission as well which is really positive so synod wasn't all negative 
Yes, which is good. Other interesting things either in or around Synod that are related to marriage, trouble with the Lord's Prayer introduction, fathers not being that a positive thing in society. <laughs> <laughs> what, what on earth? <laughs> I, well, I, I, this was Stephen Cox, the Archbishop of York, who just included a kind of what appeared to be a throwaway line. It was actually scripted saying that our unity is based around the fact that we pray our father. And then he just had a little aside saying, I recognize that the word father is problematic for those who feel as though they've been oppressed by patriarchy. Now, of course, <laughs> all the secular press went mad and just jumped on that <laughs> thing and ignored the rest of what he said. Yeah. And there's a lesson in communication, isn't it? That, that issues around gender, uh, uh, sexed language, father, mother, these are all controversial. You cannot just, if you're aware of these things, you cannot just lob these things out and expect no one to pick them up. Um, I think the papers did misre misrepresent what he said, but actually you need to say these things much more carefully. So again, I've just published an article on my blog um, just this morning about that whole question about, about sex language, about God. Yeah, and I've got I to gotta recommend people go and read your blog because it is very, very good. So we'll put the uh, the address up on screen so people can go and look at that. Yeah. Um, but, but that's very good. And also uh, you've written lots of interesting works around these and lots of other issues. I recommend people go and read those too. Yeah. Um, well, we'll wait until November then, Ian, and see what happens. And we will, but don't hold your breath to because these three groups now being disbanded um, we're told that all the necessary theological work around the whole thing about living in love and faith is going to be done by the faith and order commission they are just a group of people who meet part-time they've all got full-time jobs they don't have the resources so i can guarantee that none of these questions are going to be answered by november uh the questions are multiplying we had a meeting of the house of clergy they generated another 84 questions around this that need to be dealt with and, and the existing questions have not been dealt with we haven't done work on ecumenical documents we haven't done any work on reconciling any of the proposals with the past statements to the house of bishops and the positions of the church of england so when we come to november it's not going to be resolved then either well, let's see if we can catch up with you after that, if you're willing, and see where, if anywhere, we've got to. Have uh, to speak Rever to you again. Reverend Dr. Ian Paul, a real privilege, as always. Thank you very much. You're welcome.